Today I'm going to consider a wide range of green issues. Any of the main subjects that I'm going to cover could be a lecture in themselves or even a textbook. If you wonder how I came into this field, zero carbon housing has been an interest of mine for 20 years. I will tend to refer specifically to offices rather than retail or residential developments, although the principles will always be the same. As I talk, you will find that I regard being green and money as being the same thing. Going green can be a cost if you do not treat it as a friend and an ally. Use being green as a tool to help the environment, yes, but also use it to help you to make better profits. The clever person is the one that can do the same job to a higher standard with less energy because energy is money. On the screen to my right, anything that's in green comes from Bream. Anything that's in purple comes from Lead. Water, a dangerous friend. Flood risk can be broken down to two headings. A local problem caused by heavy rain landing on a flat site with inadequate drainage, or flooding caused by water that fell some distance from the site, which then inundates the site. If you can manage a site that might flood in a thoughtful way, then you will get points towards green accreditation. Romania is fortunate because much of its steep land is still forested. But increasingly there are floods as water comes down the major rivers from elsewhere in Europe. And as a result of land being covered in concrete. This is partly a planning problem. Densities are too high and the surface water drainage system is inadequate to cope. The fact that Bucharest is almost flat does not make things easy. This is not just a Romanian problem. The British government also encourages overdevelopment, but there is always a limit to how many people you can place on old infrastructure. It is also a matter of profit seeking. Land prices are high, and because people can overdevelop, they do overdevelop. And only a government can resolve these sorts of issues. The only certain solution is not to build in areas that might flood and to follow all the green principles that are available to prevent water accumulating in the first place. There is always data available on rainfall and flooding. Never build anywhere that there has been a flood in the last 200 years unless you add on a bit more. In the UK, we add on 20, sorry, 30 centimeters to be on the safe side and in the USA, they tend to add on another meter. If the records are unreliable, then go for a minimum of one meter above the last recorded high storm water level. Showing that flooding has been considered is rewarded by the LEED accreditation system. I have master planned business parks next to rivers that are prone to flooding. In the UK, I'm not allowed to raise the whole level of the plot because the floodplain is needed for rainwater. What I do is raise the buildings themselves so that the ground floor slab is 30 centimeters above the 200 year stormwater level. But sometimes I even allow all the car parks and the landscape to vanish underwater in a controlled way. As a big flood only occurs every, say, 20 years, and the water is usually only 20 centimeters deep, who cares? Floods seldom last more than a day or two, and then things go back to normal. Offices usually function 240 days a year, and so if a tenant loses one day every 5,000 days, who cares? Floods are never instant, and there is always time to empty a car park, particularly if it is able to flood in a controlled manner. So this is a case where green means thinking in harmony with nature, and accepting that nature can be unpredictable but in a very predictable way. Be careful though, in places around Bucharest, buildings have been built on fill placed on wet ground. Roads, distribution centers, and houses have been put on poorly compacted ground, some of which will liquefy when there is an earthquake. A proper risk analysis has to be made when you select a site, and piling and the need for suspended ground floor slabs has to be considered if filling takes place. All these factors have green accreditation points attached to them. Stormwater management. The problem of managing rainwater that lands on a site is easily overcome by having a low area on the site that can accommodate water 
while it soaks into the ground or strains slowly into the nearest watercourse. Porous landscape or open voids formed under hard surfaces can hold water while it soaks into the ground. If the water is to flow into a natural watercourse or stormwater sewer, then stormwater balancing becomes important. This approach is already operational in Romania as part of building regulations, but it is usually handled in a very inefficient way. On new developments, large tanks are usually formed in the basement and the water is pumped out of them every time that it rains. This converts an environmental protection mechanism into an environmental liability. In other words, flooding is avoided at the expense of electricity. The cost-effective solution is not to store the water deep underground, but to keep it at the surface. There are many ways that this can be done. Often the planners now want parts of a site to be set aside for permanent landscape, in which case a depression can be created which can flood on a regular basis, but which also contains trees. No tree minds having wet feet for a couple of days. Or voids can be created under the pavement, say one meter deep, that can hold water. A bit of cunning and pumps are not required. Or if they are required, then a system of weirs can be installed so that the water only passes into them during a major storm and not every shower, which is often the case at the moment. Runoff is very different between a roof and a forest. Up to 75% of the water landing on an urban area is lost by runoff, whilst only 5% is lost from a forest. It is possible to store water in tanks, but on many sites, holding back water on the roof is the best option. A layer of substrate only 15 centimeters thick can absorb up to 90% of the rainfall in summer and up to 75% in winter. Erosion. Erosion usually occurs when the vegetation cover is removed from an area and the ground is soft and steep. The secret is not to remove the vegetation cover until the very last minute and to replace it as soon as possible. Placing mats or turf on the ground will allow water to soak in. Waterborne pollution reduction and sedimentation control. This is an important element for qualifying for grease certification under LEED. The word pollution tends to be used more broadly in the United States than it is in Europe. This can simply be a question of preventing water washing into a watercourse. But it also covers oils that need to be taken out by separate. Once a project starts on site, the responsibility for what happens is transferred to the contractor. And so careful, carefully planning cut and fill operations and stockpiling materials is a problem for him alone. Many factors then come into play. Do I need to strip a big area all at once? Should I build settlement basins? How will I phase the operations? Simple measures like stockpiling and consolidating loose material is a considerable help. If soil is properly stacked so that it stays dry, it can be handled in almost any weather. The secret is to control any earth moving operations. This means good planning and management. A well-managed site is always tidy. If soil is spread around, then it will soak up water, which makes it harder to handle and more expensive. The other thing is to ensure that materials are moved once and once only. I have watched the same pile of soil on a site moved four or five times in the course of a project, just because no one had a plan. Shifting soil is a slow, expensive, energy-consuming process that needs thought. Research does show that the level of genetic abnormalities in children is significantly higher within five kilometers of a large landfill site. The liquid that drains out of domestic refuse is probably one of the most toxic materials on the planet, as it is everything that society wants to forget about. If it leaks into the groundwater, the effects can be very serious. The recent edict that industry should move out of cities is good because it takes away the source of a problem but the legacy of industrial use can be very serious and long-lasting. I had a site in England where there were PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, in the groundwater. This was because the site was covered by an aircraft factory. These chemicals can cause all sorts of problems, including birth defects. We had to sink wells and pump out the groundwater and aerate it to destroy the PCBs for two years before we could get a building permit. 
Sometimes toxic chemicals are uncovered by construction works, but then a whole range of new problems comes into play. There are areas in Romania where the ground is heavily contaminated. These areas can be recovered, but usually doing so is very expensive. In such cases, the best option is usually to cap the area and to leave it well alone because many pollutants are very stable if they're left undisturbed. The site of the Millennium Dome in London was once the site of a gas works in the days when gas was made from coal. Exactly where the dome stands, there was a cracking plant that broke down the heavy oils that came out of the coal. After 100 years, these chemicals had soaked a long way into the ground, over 20 meters. The top two meters of very bad contamination were removed, and the rest was left where it was and covered with a plastic sheet to contain the fumes that are still being vented today. In harmony with your surroundings, development density. Today it is generally accepted that people should live in cities and this is reflected in both Bream and Lead. This is so that people can use public transport and have easy access to social amenities. Following this theme makes it easy to win accreditation points. Britain and Romania need a vast number of new homes and Romania has the potential to create a world-class environmental solution. It would be good if the Romanian government was to build a whole new eco-satellite town near Bucharest. I tried this in the UK, but the middle classes do not like people building houses. Maybe Romania will be luckier. Certainly raising the existing housing stock up to a good modern standard will be almost impossible. If the future of housing is to be green, then it would be better to start again. Protect and restore open space. The countryside is very special and has always needed to be treated with care and affection. And this is reflected in Bream and Lead. I often disagree with pressure groups in the United Kingdom because I do not consider a field of wheat to be of particular ecological importance. What I know is that when I finish master planning a large site, there are always thousands of trees and shrubs, more than there were when I started, and a whole range of unique ecosystems. If you leave space for wildlife to move into a development and repair any damage that you cause, then the wildlife can be far more diverse after you've finished than it was at the outset. Canary Wharf in London consists of huge buildings, and some of the buildings have green roofs on them. Already, rare birds and insects are colonizing the unique environment that is to be found 15 stories above the ground. I have to admit that I do like business parks. When a site is well detailed, the quality of wildlife will far exceed what was there before. In fact, the lakes on one of the sites that I master plan provides the British Rivers Authority with species of fish that cannot be grown in fish farms. So without Sony's headquarters, the rivers of southeast England be, would be without two species of fish. Protecting the ecological value of the site and minimizing site disturbance. Care has to be taken if there is an area of wildlife if there are newts, frogs, lizards, or rare flowers and insects, then these need to be treated with great care. And where possible, their habitat should be extended. If a site is congested, then the destruction will be absolute. Again, this is down to the cost of the land and the density that planners will allow on a plot. A good developer and a good design team can always get wildlife onto a site. It is even possible to produce houses that harmonize with nature. In the past, environmental beauty or ecology has not been apparently given much importance by the planning authorities in Romania, although this is now changing. But it does make a huge difference to the way that foreign investors see a site and is always a good way for scoring accreditation points. When I was a lot younger, I sat with the managing director of Arlington Properties in London and congratulated him for the care that his companies took of the environment. He looked at me as if I was completely mad and said that it was done for purely commercial reasons. If they could buy a site for, say, 20 million pounds and put in all the infrastructure for, say, 20 million pounds, they had invested 40 million pounds on the site. If interest was, say, in those days, 1% per month, uh, sort of 1% per month, then if they sold the site two months early, just because it was pretty, 
then they had won 800,000 pounds so that they could spend 400,000 pounds on landscape and 400,000 pounds into their pocket. So again, winning points of being sensitive and making money for them was the same thing. Landscape and interior design to reduce heat island effects. Summer temperatures of more than 60 degrees centigrade have been recorded on road surfaces and roofs in Bucharest. This is a problem in Bucharest because the wind speeds are relatively low. When Bucharest was composed of low-rise buildings with a dense tree canopy, the climate was probably quite acceptable. Overdevelopment has resulted in the climate becoming very unpleasant in summer. To make the summers more bearable, it is necessary to prevent both heat and light reflecting back from hard surfaces. Trees are also useful as they release water into the atmosphere. Unfortunately, in Bucharest, the enthusiastic laying, relaying of streets has made them better for people, but has caused serious damage to the established trees. The planners have recently started to demand that forest trees be planted on all major sites, but it will be 30 to 40 years before these trees start to have an effect. Of course, this then brings in the question of conserving water. If plants are well irrigated, then they can grow by rates of up to two meters per annum. If you keep them short of water, they hardly grow at all. There is no such thing as a plant that can grow without water. Stay alive, maybe, but not grow. Green points can still be scored by using gray water for irrigation. Anything that releases water into the air will ameliorate the climate. If the decision was made to try and change the climate of Bucharest, then buildings would need to be more widely spaced to let the air circulate. There would need to be lots of trees and lots of water features. One important cause of the heat island effect is roofs, and these can be modified by placing compost on them and planting sedums to give green roofs. The only problem is that in very long, hot summers, these plants do die and never recover. As a result, every green roof needs a small amount of irrigation in a long, hot summer. Composting. Garden waste, and in fact almost any organic material, can be composted to be used as a peat substitute. The trouble is that it does take a large amount of capital expenditure to establish a facility and needs a huge throughput of material to be commercially viable. To make this a practical proposition, it will probably require the cooperation of the city authorities. Composting is not a game to play at. And what drains out of the heaps of rotting material is highly toxic. 